It's Sunday, February 19, 2023. Welcome to The Weekend Show, where we take a deep dive into the news of the week. Please also subscribe to the 5-Minute News Daily Briefing Podcast on iTunes or wherever you get yours. And I'm also thrilled to announce the launch of the 5-Minute News Patreon, where you can subscribe to my work and get exclusive access to bonus content, live Q&As, and much more at patreon.com slash 5-Minute News. Joining us today is a winning trial attorney, business consultant, and co-anchor and founder of the Legal AF podcast, Sir Michael Popok. Welcome back to The Weekend Show. <laughs> That's true. I have been recently knighted by an acquisition of a small parcel in Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, yeah, I, I also have some friends who call me Sir Anthony, and I don't like it. It doesn't sit very well with me. No. But, you know, we'll take yeah. it. We'll take it. Yeah. Um, Listen, I was I, looking be, up... b- before you jump in, I just, yes. I just I listened to the... Uh, Intro. It sounds like am, am I the launch episode for your new Patreon account? I guess you are. Yes, I hadn't <laughs> thought of it like that, but I guess Honored. you are the you you are the special guest on the uh, the launch of the Patreon. Honored. Yeah, it's great. You know, we we uh, the Midas uh, Touch Network that we're all on does a version of that, and um, you know, they, it's it's great. I mean, there, there's a lots of exclusive things that the um, our listeners and followers who seem to enjoy what we do. Uh, it's not going to stop anything I know that you're doing on your regular shows, but it's just some extra interesting content, special, formal, formalized for them. And I think I think it's great. And thank you for having me be the, the person to help you launch your Patreon. Oh, it's a pleasure. I mean, people have I, I did it because people have been asking me to do something similar. They're like, where can we? Because obviously, five minute news every day will always be available and always be free. And the weekend show that we do here on the Midas Touch Network but people have said, you know, where can we get more of you? And so that's kind of why I was, uh, you know, decided to set up the Patreon. So yeah, five I minutes be, of you is not enough, Anthony. It, I've been I've been told that <laughs> I would disagree, but there it is. Um, you were last here on the weekend show in uh, April, which is like ten months ago. Wow. Um, yeah. We've both changed a lot, you know. Um, <laughs> you've gone grey, and I've uh, lost all my hair. But a lot has happened, kind of politically. In the in the world, but or certainly in the United States in that time, and so um, maybe we'll have a little kind of catch up on how different the world is. Tomorrow is actually President's Day, uh, for those parents with children like me. We'll certainly know. Like, what are we what are we going to do with our kids on Monday? Um, but I do want to talk about uh, former U.S. President Jimmy Carter because there was an announcement uh, a couple of days ago that he's decided to spend his remaining time at home with his family and receive hospice care instead of additional medical intervention. Uh, they say he has the full support of his family and the medical team. Uh, Carter family is asking for privacy during this time. And that, that was a press release from the Carter Center. I mean, this guy is 98 years of age, right? Um, and I was kind of looking up what the world was like when he was born in 1924. I mean, can you imagine, like, living now and seeing the world as it is now, not just with technology, but certainly in politics, you know, with the division and the the kind of... This kind of enemies thing, you know, which I don't think really existed back then, where where the left and the right are kind of enemies. I mean, it it must be from someone like pre- former President Carter to kind of look across this timeline. I mean, w- what a shock to the system. Maybe, but let's remember how Jimmy Carter got elected, and the and the era that he followed, because you don't have a Jimmy Carter president unless you have a Richard Nixon. Right. And the corruption of the Watergate scandal, and you don't have Ford pardoning him, um, and all of the animus that came around that. To say there weren't divisions, I think, is a little bit of an understatement. I mean, Richard Nixon authorized the break-in of the Democratic National uh, Committee uh, headquarters in the Watergate Hotel, and did a lot of other things that were um, impossible to imagine at that time. Carter a plain-spoken governor, peanut farmer, naval officer from Plains, Georgia, was a breath of fresh air. I mean, he ran on a campaign of competency and compassion. I was a, I was a young boy when, when he ran for office. I was like 11. And I remember the end of Watergate and watching it on television. That's much of a nerd I was. And I remember Jimmy Carter and his campaign. And uh, they never thought he'd get out of the primaries. We'll talk about some other people today that are running now that we think probably won't get out of the primaries right. either. But Jimmy Carter got out, and I love the fact that even though he's really literally on his deathbed, he filed a legal brief just recently, and he identified himself, I mean, so 
so with so much humility and so much humbleness, he said, I'm Jimmy Carter. I'm paraphrasing. I was a former Sunday school teacher, um, naval officer. Uh, I think he was on the town council of his town, governor of Georgia, and honored to be the 39th president of the United States. I mean, the fact that he even felt he had to identify himself, you know, oh, that Jimmy Carter. Um, and look, he had a lot of problems. The way the, the Biden has been attacked now, um, they were even uh, more magnified for Jimmy Carter. He inherited a foreign policy that was in shambles following Richard Nixon, a cleanup after the Vietnam War, um, issues with China, and of course, the Iran hostage crisis. Um, and, the, and, and that went on his entire presidency and really helped torpedo his presidency. And you also had an economic set of problems, some of which he inherited, including petroleum and gas issues and gas lines around the country and inflation and stagflation and all of that. So his presidency was racked with both domestic and foreign problems. I mean, Lyndon Johnson accomplished a lot on the domestic side. It was his foreign policy that was problematic. Jimmy had it both ways. Had it, it was beaten with both ends of the stick during that presidency. But there's a reason he won the Nobel Peace Prize. I mean, he was, he was, and we'll see the jury's out on Barack Obama as a former president. We know what he did as president. But right now, Jimmy Carter is the probably the greatest former president we've ever had in the history of America. And, uh, you know, Obama's just getting started. You know, he's just getting his library up and running, and he's just getting his institute. But the Carter Foundation, you know, the, that you that you mentioned, um, does real work around the country, uh, around the world, monitoring elections uh, in places where you know despotism still still reigns, and the rest. So, it's a, it'll be a sad day in the next few hours or days when when Jimmy Carter finally passes. I I was telling you offline that I had the pleasure of going to his presidential library uh, and museum in uh, in Atlanta, near Atlanta, and uh, you forget how how much he accomplished. But it's mainly about the man, the person, more so than his presidential accomplishments. And let's not forget, Rosalind is still with us and still living in that little house in Plains, Georgia, where Joe Biden, because Jimmy Carter could not make it to the inauguration, even though he desperately wanted to, you know, the first president to ever visit Plains, Georgia, besides Jimmy Carter, is Joe Biden. But this was 1977. So <laughs> it, was a, it was a different world, right? And when I talk about political parties being enemies these days. Um, that's, that's very different, isn't it, to even though, of course, they were in opposition, there, people still were civil. There was a kind of civility to, to this. And, and that now has completely gone. I mean, any chance of bipartisanship, other than some Republicans taking credit for the, for the infrastructure bill and <laughs> happily taking the funding for their bridges and Still criticizing Biden in the next breath. I mean, that's why I that's loved it. New, not, isn't it? I loved. I loved it. A State of the Union when he said, "See you at the ribbon cuttings," right? <laughs> Which was a great, a great job. Yeah. It, it is totally new. I was just talking to a, a. I have a number of Republican friends, of course. If I have friends who happen to be Republicans, and we were talking that our brand of our party, my being a Democrat, their being a Republican, we are so close. We had been really so close in terms of policy, and in as you said, civility. But the new generation of MAGA over here and AOC over there, or whatever it is, you know, on the uh, on the far extremes, there is very little civility. That's why we talk about, you know, the gang of eight. That's all there is. <laughs> there's like there's yeah. eight people in a Senate or in a House that are doing bipartisanship, statesmanship, statespersonship, um, and that that didn't used to be. I mean, you know, Patrick Moynihan used to cross the aisle all the time to get really important policy passed for America. It's the for America part that is missing. There's no bigger patriot than than me. I mean, it could be equal me, but no bigger patriot than me. And that doesn't have a D or an R or an I next to it. Just the, the, the a love of this, this country. Is that yeah. The moderate Republicans, and I was I was with one yesterday, an older guy, you know, retired. He's lost, he said, Tommy's lost a lot of friends because they've all gone to the extreme right, and he can't, he can't do that, because he's a civil person. He, he, he said, I can't vote. I have, nobody represents me. I mean, that's going to be the problem going forward, isn't it? That, that people are either just going to not vote, or they'll just stick with Republicans because there is no third party that represents them. Yeah, the Democrats have in their party, of course, 
uh, people that are within the progressive tent, but are at the extremes. But let's be frank. There's a reason Nikki Haley said that the Republicans have lost seven out of the eight popular votes. The Democrats, when it, when they come out of their primary, by and large, go to the center. That's Clinton. That's Obama. That's Joe Biden. Yeah. The more moderate of the candidates in the primary. Could AOC be president of the United States one day? Maybe. But the way the Democrats want to be, they realize that the only way to have power and influence over people's life with policy, to put government into action, is to actually win elected office. You can't do that from a Twitter platform. You can only do that for within the halls of Congress or the presidency or the judiciary. You got to win in order to do that. So we're, you know, people say we do a lot of hand wringing on this side of the aisle um, over things, and, and we probably do, and we eat our young a little quicker than the Republicans, but we also elect and take out of the primary moderates who can win a national election. And and that's why everyone's like, how did they get three houses? How did they get all three branches of government? Mm -hmm. Because we're in the moderate lane. We're there, There's a power vacuum in the center. And if the, the, the country the is more progressive than politicians would like you to think it is, that's the that's other thing, too. isn't it? That, that yeah. America is, is not this kind of far right extremist country that that MAGA Republicans and, and Donald Trump and, and all of his surrogates would have you think. And certainly Sean Hannity and those representatives who kind of put America on television, they do not represent the people. And, and national polling is always completely different to the to the thoughts and the feelings and the politics of, of the population. That's why they're always that's why the Republicans um, and followers of them are always gobsmacked when they don't win national. Elect what do you mean Joe Biden got seven million more votes than we did? What do you mean he won all of those states? DeSantis is we're going to talk about that a little bit later. DeSantis is going to be in for a rude awakening because being a petty despot in a in a state where you completely control a captured and captive uh, House and Senate, state House and Senate, the legislature, and they will do literally anything you ask them to do. Take on Disney and ask them to leave the state. Sure, that sounds like a great idea. Um, every policy he wants, critical race theory, uh, against the uh, AP class for African-American studies, whatever is in, he, he wakes up with over his Cheerios, this group, this band of people are ready to rubber, rubber stamp that. That doesn't work around the country when he has to talk to women voters in middle America, when he has to talk to liberals and independents and try to get them to close the 7 million, do 7 million person or more popul popular vote gap. He can't, I don't think he can do it, but we'll talk about that at the time. Let's just go back to Jimmy Carter for a second. Tell me what Americans mean, or certainly Republicans mean, when whenever a Democrat mentions Jimmy Carter, <laughs> Republicans laugh, right? Yeah. Like he was some kind of joke president. Tell, tell me the history behind that. Yeah, well, look, Jimmy Carter, you can say a lot of amazing things, and I, I do not want to get dragged in, even by you on this show, into dissing um, the 39th president of the United States. But I will tell you that if you looked at all of the metrics, it wasn't a successful presidency. Doesn't mean he wasn't a successful person or he wasn't right for the country as a salve, as a bomb to, to heal a tremendous amount of um, lack of faith in government, mistrust in government coming out of the Pentagon Papers, and Vietnam coming out of the entire Nixon corrupt uh, White House. We needed a Jimmy Carter. A Jimmy Carter has to follow a Richard Nixon the way that an Obama has to follow, you know, uh, who he followed. Um, and, and, and Biden has to follow a Trump, to be frank. They are the men, these are men right now, hopefully that'll change one day, but they are male, male presidents that um, are for a time. They're for a moment in time. Does Joe Biden get elected four years earlier or, well, let's not talk about four years from now or two years from now. You know, at the he ran for office in other eras and for various reasons, Joe Biden didn't win, but he, he, he was the man for the moment. Carter was the man for the moment coming out of that. But his presidency, you know, just economically was a disaster. You know, interest rates were in the double digits, gas lines for a long period of time, most of his presidencies. They were rationing gas. It started with the Ford administration, but it continued with Carter. Stagflation, everything economically, other than the fact that he created the Department of Education, which, which mm -hmm. I happen to like, 
is yeah. he did he did he wasn't able to accomplish much during that divided government era and on the and on the um foreign policy side while he continued the policies of Nixon in normalizing relationships with China including having the he's the only pre, he's the first president to open up full diplomatic channels with China but he, all he's really remembered for in the little and the little joke that'll go around with Republicans when they want to um, associate a Democratic president with a failed presidency is, you know, the Iran hostage crisis with 50 plus Americans trapped in the embassy um, and paraded around with with uh, blindfolds on uh, international television. And then, of course, the Iranians are smart and political. So they saw uh, somebody helpful in uh, Reagan and they wanted to get rid of Carter. So they uh, released the hostages right before you know, right, right, like during the election. Yeah. Um. And it, but anyway, that's why. And they'll they'll try to do that to Biden. They, they, it's the Carterization of Joe Biden, which I don't think works. Because to be honest, the the vast majority of voters today, especially the ones that matter, don't remember Jimmy Carter directly, other than from their civics civics class in high school. Is he also proof that politics takes a while to? kind of shift like to, to to move so even if you come in with good intentions and you and you make policy adjustments the the public sector is like on a two-year delay right so so whatever you do it kind of it's a very slow moving train and things don't happen overnight and you know we've seen that with with biden and we, we certainly saw that with trump it's like some take credit for the previous guy's work because they take advantage advantage of the slow moving train that's and right. then they, you know, and then it doesn't work the other, the other way, excuse me, because then you have at the moment we have uh, Republicans criticizing the southern border and Biden's migrant crisis. And yet the policies are the same effectively as they were under Trump and nothing changed. Like the day Biden got elected, nothing on the southern border changed. All the policies remained exactly the same. Yeah. And Biden did a good job again, back to his State of the Union in saying some of the problems that I'm dealing with now should have been dealt with by even Democratic administrations, including yeah. his own. He was in the Obama administration. Some of them stretched back to Clinton, if not further. We're going to talk about policy changes when we get to some other segments today. But no, you're exactly right. Um, they take advantage of like Trump took advantage of the Obama economy. That was going strong. Yeah, the, the trajectory um, and, for the for the growth. Absolutely, was, that's was not the Trump. Absolutely clear. Yeah, that's not the Trump economy. That was the yeah. Obama economy that, he, yeah. like you said, had a two year lag, yeah. and then he got the benefits of it. Of course, COVID put a damper on that, and then look what look what Biden's done. Set aside the stock market, which is an odd place to measure economic health for a moment. But if you look at every other measure of the economy, Biden is having a roaring economy. I mean, in terms of inflation down, jobs up, unemployment way, way down to historic levels um, and and everything else. And, and that is a function that he can take credit for, because that is what happens when you pump trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars of stimulus money in to jumpstart the economy from COVID and the shutdown. And we're seeing the benefits of that in infrastructure investment, the way Trump only tweeted about Obama doing, I mean, Biden doing, and you're seeing this is it. If you want to see what a roaring economy looks like, where there's a partnership between the private sector and the public sector, and the government has a role, this is it, everybody. And if you like it, you stay with it. If you don't like it, then you look around for some other candidate. It's worth mentioning Wall Street, though, isn't it? Because Wall Street <laughs> is a completely different entity financially to the rest of the country. And and all Trump really talked about was, you know, record w Wall Street gains. That was his benchmark for a successful economy. It was if Wall Street, his friends in Wall Street were doing well and his shares of ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine were doing well. But the reality is that a, a, a successful, and this is a trickle-down economics conversation, a, a successful Wall Street does not mean that the you know average working person feels the difference. Yeah, as most people know, I worked on Wall Street as an in-house general counsel for a company, and so I sort of saw that up close and personal for a, for a long stretch. And it's you're exactly right. The things that matter to everyday Americans in their pocketbooks, including their 401k. I don't want to say 401ks and other savings plans aren't important, um, but you, but the stock market always has to be seen in a very long trajectory, a, a very long runway, not even a two-year runway. I mean, I, I mean, I do some rebalancing of stuff, but I don't really look at whatever I've got until, I mean, I'm like 10-year plan. Let's see what's going on 10 years from now. Um, and, and, that, and, and that's the way it is. I mean, this crypto 
nanosecond, you know, day trading mentality. This doesn't work. And it's not what shows you the health of, of America, except one component of it, right, Anthony? The stock market, some of it is based on earnings, corporate earnings. And corporate earnings are generally based on consumer consumption, investment, and the like. So there is an aspect of it. But the rest of it is a bunch of you know, electronic trading platforms and brokers with relationships who are trading things not in the best interest of, you know, Mr. and Mrs. America, but based on their own economic interest to make money that day from the trade. And that's not exactly the way the economy works. Let's let's talk about um, presidents and ex-presidents for a minute. I want to quote the uh, the former president, Donald Trump, or the disgraced former president, as he's come to be known. My favorite line of late that he keeps repeating is, I thought ex-presidents were supposed to have a great life. You heard him say that? You know, he, Not in your he, 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 he keeps saying it because every time there's another case, uh, court case against him and, you know, or, or the, you know, whichever, whether it's the Southern District of New York, whoever's after him, he's always like, I don't get it. I thought ex-presidents were supposed uh, to have a great life. Let me put it another way. Are you saying, Anthony, he longs to be Jimmy Carter? Yeah, but this is my point, because I think I genuinely think he looks to Obama like, you know, walking on the sand in Hawaii with right, his Valentine's Day rolled tweets, up, right, and, right, and, uh, and, and making Netflix documentaries. And he looks at Jimmy Carter with his initiatives and he looks at presidential libraries. And I don't think there is a Trump presidential library. Is no, it's going to be a prison library. But it's, <laughs> right. It's the and same and thing. He, he can't understand because of his, you know, he he's narcissism he cannot understand how ex-presidents even bush are on speaking tours and being <laughs> revered you know the, the the warmonger bush is suddenly like an acceptable person to have at a dinner party now and and he cannot compute why he is not experiencing the same thing and why there are all these court cases and legal cases and rape cases and everything else um against him you know, Ann Coulter came out recently on a podcast that I was just reading it before I joined you. And she said, I, d I never realized until recently that President Trump is a moron. And she didn't hold back. She said he, it's well known that he was a moron, that he was stupid, um, that he was stupid. Nobody could understand how he ever got ahead in business, even though he went bankrupt so many times. It's not funny. And by the way, he was not doing well financially, just so everybody understands this. When he hit Celebrity Apprentice... He was sort of a down on his luck, four time bankrupt, failed casino operator who didn't who was who was banks were were foreclosing on left and right. But that's why that's, he took the job. That's, I was that's what say, you do that's when you've got that's, no other options. You exactly. become a reality TV host. That's who takes that job. That's what I was yeah. just about to say. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, uh, yes, you know, guys like uh, Mark, what's his name, is on uh, Shark Tank and everything else, but he and he is successful. But but he was on the balls of his backside when he got that job, mm -hmm. and that helped put him back into the public consciousness. And then he he confused and conflated that because he's a narcissist with um, success and that he should be president of the United States. And then, you know, if, we, don't, we don't know what would have happened if, if uh, Barack Obama at the White House Correspondent Dinner hadn't roasted him from the podium and basically challenged him on the birth certificate um, in his birth. Would he have run for office? I'm not sure. It was always a joke that he was running. And even people close to him thought, even he thought, that he shouldn't win and that he shouldn't run for re-election. But he's not smart. And if you hear people that really know him and work with him, he is an idiot. Um, uh, a dangerous idiot. I'm not letting him off. It's not a defense for staging a coup, but it does explain, combined with his narcissism, um, all of his conduct and behavior, criminal in nature. He's going to be our first former president who's indicted for a crime, whether it is in Fulton County, Georgia, it is in New York, Manhattan District Attorney, or it is Jack Smith's you know, federal prosecutions. He is going to be indicted. And if he wanted to go off and and wear a nice sweater like mine and sit in a rocking chair and and uh, and go on a book tour, then he shouldn't have led a coup. I, I refer to him as an accidental fascist. And I don't want to diminish the fascism because, you know, look, if you're white and privileged, there's a good chance that it didn't affect you. But if you are black and brown and holding down three or four jobs to support your family. So much of what Trump did and said 
would have had a negative effect on your life. And the reason I say he's an accidental fascist, fascist is because of that kind of moron thing that you say. You know, he is, because of his insecurity and he is and, and such a narcissist, that when someone nice, whether it be Nick Fuentes or Kanye West says nice drops things by, to him. Drops right, by for dinner. He's right. like, yeah, let's let's eat. Let's let's have cheeseburgers. <laughs> and and you know, that is the tragedy of him. Because I think I I was reading something the other day that said that he he does have a conscience. And that if it was explained to him as to how people were suffering at the hands of this fascism, he might kind of think about it and go, Okay, well maybe that's wrong. But he doesn't want anyone to explain anything to him, you know, because yeah. he has this kind of authority or, or authoritative attitude, which makes him an authoritarian. And so the tragedy of having someone like that in office is the fallout. It's like being a bad driver, isn't it? You know, the, the driver carries on, but all of the car crashing is happening behind them and, and, it's, and it's chaos. And we're going to have to live with the consequences of that now for a decade at least, a generation. Because what he has left behind in terms of the fact that the rules don't matter, that you can say anything, you can shit talk people effectively, which is something that politicians never used to do. Now they're all doing it because the guy up top said it was okay. Well, the, where, will there be more cursing on your Patreon subscribe for your, for your Patreon subscribers? I'll probably Anthony bleep Davis. out what I just said. I mean, that was the worst <laughs> oh, it's ever. Gotten, that's the part I liked. So, so no, you, he, he ripped up the social contract that we had with each other to be dignified and civil in our political discourse. Um, I talk about that all the time on my own podcast. I talk about it in my own life. I've never seen such a thing where people in public now, um, the average citizen um, in a restaurant on a street corner will say and do anything to their fellow citizen that was unheard of before. Because they've gotten permission and license, as you said, from somebody like Donald Trump. I mean, I don't have children, and I know you do, but it, it must be very difficult to raise children in an environment where Donald Trump is the moral leader of the country and has the bully pulpit. I mean, I remember Jimmy Carter literally reviving fireside chats. It didn't go that great. <laughs> from FDR, wearing a sweater like this in front say, of a in fire. A sweater, yeah. It was a very, yes, and he did it yeah. because he's a compassionate uh, candidate, a, a person as a person. And I've got news for the people that follow Donald Trump, especially at the lower end of the socioeconomic scale. Donald, and I know Donald Trump from people around Donald Trump in New York when I was there starting my career when he was a, a real estate developer of spending daddy's money. Um, he would not, uh, he would not let you shine his shoes if he, if he was in the same room with you. He would be uh, aghast if you tried to come up to him, if you were a blue collar worker or um, somebody that was not uh, someone he could uh, take for a ride for money or at his country club. He would not shake your hand because he's got a phobia about germs. He would not ride the Amtrak like Joe Biden working the room. Everybody makes fun of him because he's too touchy. Trump would be the opposite. He would be appalled. There'd be four barriers of bodyguards before you'd ever be able to get to him. And, and I always find it remarkable that those same people that look up to him and fly these flags on their pickup trucks or in my neighborhood, um, Donald Trump wouldn't give you the time of day if he saw you. Uh, that's why he stands so far away from you at a rally. <laughs> okay. But Talking it, to you at a rally is not- trick, right. isn't it, Michael? It's a confidence trick. The whole right, thing. Totally. It's not just a financial grift because a lot of these poor people have given them their last dime, given him their last dime. It's a confidence trick to convince uh, an entire movement that you care about them and you're doing it for them. And I've heard this from some of the other candidates and, and surrogates, certainly, where they talk about saving America. But nobody really identifies what that is. You know, what, what they really mean is just going back to Trumpism where we had the right to say anything and do anything and this wokeness wasn't a thing, you know, where we didn't have to acknowledge trans people or LGBT, LGBTQ plus people and just kind of have it so that it's a kind of white supremacy that, that rules. That really is what saving America is, isn't it? It's saving America from the brown people. It's saving America from, from Democrats. That's why Nikki Haley's, we're going to talk about her next, is going to have so many problems. There was a very good quote in today's New York Times 
by the uh, uh, chairman, chairwoman of the Republican Party in New Hampshire and talking about the state of the party and the problem that Nikki Haley is going to have as a woman of color, as a woman and a woman of color in that party. And she said, this is the quote, if you, if you want to know what you have to do to be an influential woman in the GOP today, compare Marjorie Taylor Greene to Liz Cheney. Which one of them actually brings gravitas and experience and genuine commitment to democracy to the table? And which one of them is currently serving in Congress? I mean, that I sums mean, it all up. That's the party. How Marjorie Taylor Greene is serving in Congress is kind of, it's almost like the American dream, isn't it? I mean, that's the tragedy of this story, that, that you know, you can, you can do anything. You can literally, you know, become a congressperson. You can be walking in the halls of power. And, you know, you could have been running a gym or running a restaurant. It's like, it, it doesn't matter. So I'm sure there are plenty of people that will look at Marjorie Taylor Greene and be like, yeah, you know, if she can do it, then so can we. She is representing us. She's a real person. I mean, I don't want to give credit to Marjorie Taylor Greene because, you know, obviously. The touching Horatio Hitler story. I, I understand her, her, her limitations, but I do recognize that there is a large percentage of America that will see her as a role model. Yeah, I mean, look, 700,000 people in a north corner of Georgia elected a gym owner and fitness instructor who never uh, provided any service to her community prior to running for office, who stood on the shoulders of QAnon and election-denying theories, and Jewish lasers, and everything else. And that 700,000 out of 320 million, whatever we got in the United States, put her standing with the gavel, presiding over the house when McCarthy had to take a bathroom break. I mean, that imagery yeah. of her yeah. with the gavel as the reward for her supporting, you know, the public emasculation <laughs> and circumcision of McCarthy on, pub, on on national television in order for him to get the speaker the speakership. I mean, if that isn't as you said, but right, other people could be looking at it like me too. I could yeah. be Marjorie Taylor Greene. Yeah, but we mustn't <laughs> underestimate that because yeah. because you know there's 330 million Americans, 70 million people voted for Donald Trump. You you you, you cannot deny that there are enough people. You know, there's only, from the country that I'm from, there's, there's only like 70 million people in the whole country. Right. Do you see what I mean? It's like right. you, cannot, you cannot turn down this as the reality of modern America. You can't think that everyone's extremist and everybody's fringe because that extremism and that fringe is now the mainstream. And those people do have to be listened to. They well, might be m misinformed and they might be falling foul of misinformation and yeah. they've been lied to. But it's still their reality, Michael. But to a goldfish, the whole world is inside the bowl. And to Marjorie Taylor Greene, she has conflated and deluded herself in that since she has a platform and she's got some followers, maybe she could be vice president. I heard she's running for vice president at this moment. We'll talk about other people who may be running for well, She said for she's really... not earning enough money being a congressperson. She, <laughs> was, sure she said she not. can't live the grift, on 100 The grift hours. is not large enough for her. She has right. to find a bigger grift. But So she's probably running for that, although that would be like... We would love that on the progressive side, Democratic side. That would be like Palin, go, you know, torpedoing McCain from the inside. That would be great, great for us if she tried to join with one of these candidates. But there's a reason why um, in the modern era we haven't had a member of the House be a president. Not while they were members of the House. They made a House and then Senate or governor, this or that. Um, because they are um, so um, in a box, in a very small box in their territory um, and yes, it's an echo chamber and they're getting a lot of, you know, Fox News needs content one day. So they put Marjorie Taylor Greene on. It's the same reason I think ultimately uh, DeSantis fails is because, you know, he's just a bigger goldfish in a bigger goldfish bowl. But Florida and how he has run it in the COVID era and post-COVID era. I saw an interview. I don't know if you caught this. He gave an exclusive inter interview to the New York Post. Why, why not? And he said that one of the things that he was running against is that um, – the forced agenda of the Democrats on America. What do you think you're doing in Florida against women, women's rights to choose, uh, education? Trans I mean, rights. Uh, it's yeah. every, I mean, what do you think yeah. you're doing? And do you think you're going to take that on the road and that's going to be able to be writ large if you were to, you know, come out of the primary? The problem is, well, we're going to talk. I, I don't, I don't want to 
steal the thunder well, that, of this discussion. I mean, that I'm, discussion. I'm, I'm happy to get ahead of ourselves. So, so let's yeah. look at the 2024 lineup currently, because Donald Trump announced first. Just explain the timing of his announcement <laughs> with with what happened the next day, pretty much with Merrick Garland yeah. announcing the special counsel. I mean, the, the timing of his announcement was obviously because he knew that something bad was coming legally and he thought well, he would be protected. Yeah, I, I think that... Um well, I, let, let me let me just. I don't think it was um, one led to the other per se. I don't think he knew this. Merrick Garland was left with no choice. I mean, we'll just do a, a one minute on that. Yeah. Under the independent counsel rule, once his boss got um, the the target of criminal investigations as his opponent, Donald Trump. Once Donald Trump announced that he was running against Merrick Garland's boss in the executive branch, uh, Joe Biden. The conflict of interest was so obvious under the statute that Merrick Garland had no choice. People are like, oh, he doesn't have any balls or gravitas. He, no, he had no choice the way the independent counsel statute is written. What Trump did, though, that you're so right about is he watching these five or six different criminal investigations around the country, state and federal, and the, and the noose that's kind of tightening around him. He had to do something. There's no downside for him announcing the presidency because then he can make everything political and it makes the Department of Justice have to jump through new hoops and walk through um, different prosecutorial discretion manuals before they make the ultimate decision to pull the trigger on indicting a president. Something Fulton County and the state and Fawny Willis does not have those problems. So, of course, he was going to run. It allows him to grift and get money. Yeah, um, as it's, a, a, it's a fundraising opportunity. Yeah, he he an, needs to pay the legal fees. It's, an, it's not really an insulator, but it, it, it does, you know, it, it's a little bit of a solar plexus punch to Merrick Garland, the DOJ, to say, all right, now you're going to have to go to that chapter in the manual, the DOJ manual, about indicting candidates as they're running. That, I think they'll do it, but he's created another hurdle for them to have to analyze. So there's no downside. He needs the cash. He's running out of cash. Okay, he refinanced everything about two years ago, or he tried to, before the 17-count felony conviction for tax fraud that was that has been found by a jury in December against his main companies. His, his access to capital now, his access to U.S. banks or international banks is very, very limited. OK, he might have to go to Dubai. He might have to go to the Saudis. He might have to go somewhere. And he's got a stream of income that's coming from existing projects. But his ability to like go get a revolving line of credit for a few hundred million dollars to tide him over. And, and this is a guy with that family that has a tremendous monthly nut of expenses. I mean, I don't know if it's 10 million dollars a month, 20 million dollars a month. Forget Hunter Biden and his laptop. How much a month does the Trump family need to support themselves? Because that's a drain, and he's not replacing it fast enough in terms of new revenue. And so he's got a financial problem, which he solves with the Save America PAC, the presidential PAC, solves for a minute. Because, you know, Jack Smith's and one of his grand juries is looking at the $250 million raised by the Save America PAC since the 2020 election and where is that money gone and the lies that were told in order to collect that money from his gullible followers and you have to be pretty desperate to put out a deck of cards with your face on <laughs> on each card right with a badly illustrated <laughs> image of a strong man i mean you yeah. know that was a that was a financial grift you know he thought he could jump right on the back of the kind of pokemon trading cards and leave it to him. He's always a day late and a dollar short. Yeah. NFTs were really big like 18 months ago. <laughs> By the time he got into them, they were a joke. It's like getting yeah. into crypto now. Why doesn't right. he just become an FTX spokesperson? I just want to ask you about this stigma in U.S. culture about not prosecuting former presidents. The idea that you would put a president on a pedestal to, you know, culturally that means that prosecutors or attorney generals are nervous, not from a legal standpoint, but from a, from a popular cultural standpoint. What does it say about the system? What does it say about the country? And it almost kind of flies in the face of that kind of freedom and patriotism and respecting the, the office of the president. Just explain, as an American and as a lawyer, where that comes from. Well, let me do it from this direction. So I'm going to ask you a question. 
Suppose Joe Biden, like Gerald Ford, talking about Carter, in order to heal the country and to put an end to this long national misery, decided, because he has the right, without having to take a poll, to pardon Donald Trump for all federal crimes and put this to an end T- tomorrow. What do you think the national reaction on both sides of the aisle would be to that? Probably as, as bad as the in, in, an indictment if it was to follow. Right. And when Ford did it, there was a lot of hand-wringing. He probably didn't win the election, although there's, you know, there's always all the political scientists that looked at the issue said if the election campaign had gone two more weeks at the rate he was catching up to Jimmy Carter, he would have passed Jimmy Carter and we wouldn't yeah. have had Jimmy Carter as a president. So he, it looks like he was able, by and large, to shake off the uh, political hit that he took for, for making the pardon decision. But he did it in an era, as you started this podcast with at the top, a different era where people were like, they may not have agreed with it, but they saw a certain amount of, um, they, they took a, a certain amount of comfort from the fact that he was trying to heal the country and doing something positive about it. So that, yes, there was a whole group of people that went to jail, including the attorney general and the chief of staff for Nixon and the rest. Um, so yes, after three years of an investigation on national television, you know, people did, heads did roll, but Nixon didn't go away. And 10 years later, you know, Tricky Dicky, Tan, Reddy, and Rested was back on television giving, you know, the David Frost interviews and then interviews even after that. And there was even talk that he was not running for office again, but that he was consulting with, you know, like Reagan and other candidates as a as a elder statesman, as a Mandarin for the Republican Party. Um, he was making a comeback and he eventually died. But, but, but he, that's he, part of the culture that I'm talking about. Right. The fact that having been a president, no matter which president, <laughs> that that is in itself such an achievement. It's like the ultimate success in, in because America doesn't have kings and queens as we do in Europe. And so to achieve the presidency is, is such a pl- place of high office. And in some, you know, evangelical Christian circles, it is a it is a religious right. It, it is it is a God given right. It is almost the the second coming in a way. Yeah. And and that makes it very difficult to kind of put someone like that in an orange jumpsuit and send them to Guantanamo Bay. I don't think that's I don't disagree with you, but I don't think that's the reason he hasn't been indicted yet. As I said on my own podcast yesterday with with Ben Mysalis, my co-anchor, the first we, we've been doing it for two years, the podcast, Legal AF. And congratulations on that, by the way. Thank you very much. I also this is a very good moment <laughs> to mention that you guys on that on that live episode Oh, yeah. You had the most watched YouTube news stream above all other news networks. It, it was week. crazy. And the Chinese yeah. balloon had just gotten shot down. So yeah. I don't even know how we beat that. But yeah. yes, it, it, we, get, we get 11, 12,000 people watch us do it live and are on our mm. chat. And then, you know, 250,000 or more a week that watch the show. But Well, I'm, we, I'm one of them. So. We good. Thank you. I appreciate it. Mm. You too. I watch you back. But, but what we said the other day was the first year, let's say, of our podcast, let's say 2022-ish, 2021, 2022, was about investigations, investigations, investigations. And process. And now it's about indictments, trials, trials, and trials. And so the people that are casual followers of the law, who, you know, let's, we're all sort of law junkies. The, the mo- Always the top-rated shows on in America historically have either been medical <laughs> doctor shows or yeah. lawyer court shows. Yeah. And mo- and movies and but there you know it's very compressed you know law and order you get law and order all in sixty minutes or fifty two minutes after commercials trials and investigations take two three four five years we're impatient understandably because it has a real life impact on the campaign on Donald Trump running again and becoming president again so we're all anxious and can't sleep at night. But the criminal justice system here is moving rapidly. I mean, in less in two years, you know, you have four or five hundred convictions from Jan sixth. You've got now trials in April against Donald Trump, against Fox News for defamation, against Donald Trump for civil rape for things that happened before. And decisions are imminent. And I think imminent means like the next week or two with Fawny Willis in Fulton County, now that the aspects of the of the special purpose grand jury report have come out and you've got the manhattan da which is has a brand new 
special grand jury of 23 people for the last three weeks looking at all things Stormy Daniels and Donald Trump with Michael Cohen Cohen going in for live testimony. So he's going to get indicted by one of these people. Um, People attack Merrick Garland a lot for being too sober, too methodical. And they, they equate that with him not having gravitas or brass to make the decision. But as soon as all the facts line up, and, they're, and obviously they're waiting for one or two more things to choose to drop before they indict. They don't feel they have everything wrapped up. They're missing one more interview or Mark Meadows turning or in New York, Alan Weisselberg, the former CFO, disgrace sitting in Rikers Island, testifying about Donald Trump and Stormy Daniels. They are waiting because if you force, and I'm a trial lawyer, you force a trial lawyer to go to trial before they are ready. They will put on a trial, but it is not the trial that they want. It is the trial that they you're forcing them to do. So they rather than kick themselves and say, oh, if we only stripped away the attorney client or executive privilege from one more person for Donald Trump, we would have had him. They don't want any regrets. And they're willing to put up with people like you, me, and our public complaining about the pace at which this is going because they're not ready. And you know when you know that that they're ready? When they indict. I'm going to take a position, an opposite position. And I'm not a lawyer. (laughs) That's okay. But I am am an observer of American culture. And I think that they may indict, but I do not see Trump ever paying the price or facing the consequences – I, I I don't see, I think there are so many people, and Mark Meadows, you mentioned, is one of them, who Trump can blame and have other people take the heat for this. Because Trump has been committing crimes his whole life and has never really been caught up with by the law, right? He has this ability to, he may be a moron, but he's not a moron when it comes to this kind of very narrow field of view that he tries to you know, he, he feels exonerated from anything that's happening, you know, and the way he speaks using that kind of mobster code. Everything he does protects him from from legal problems. So he can't be that stupid. But I honestly feel that we're all, those of us who are, you know, pro-democracy and anti-fascist, or Antifa, as some people like to call <laughs> us, we are obviously very keen for him to go down for this. I just don't think this country has the capacity to do that because I think that he, there's so many people in his orbit that will take the rap for this. And, and Weisselberg was one of them. You know, nobody had heard of this guy. And, and really, Trump should have gone down for that. And, and it was defect, deflected onto his CFO. Yeah. But that's my fear. And, and I don't even think he'll end up wearing a, an ankle bracelet living in Mar-a-Lago under house arrest for the rest of his life. I don't even think it'll come to that. I, I honestly think he is going to get away with this, and I think he will run for president, and I think he will almost win. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I like different opinions. That's what makes podcasting fun. Right. Um, my my working theory is that he's going to get indicted by one of these prosecutors for one of these things. And it may not be the thing that we want, but it may be the thing that we get. Whether it's Stormy Daniels, the one that I think is further along is the Georgia inter- election interference, based on the phone call that he made and the series which is of, recorded, which is it's recorded. Just, it's crazy, isn't it? That the evidence yeah. is is in the is in the public eye. You know, it's right. on YouTube. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of circumstantial evidence on the federal side for Mar-a-Lago, for uh, Jan Sixth, and the other jury, uh, grand juries that are out there. But the one that has the most tangible evidence is um, is Fawny Willis. Right. And she's got all the rest of it, too, which is the conspiracy. And she's very good at uh, what we call uh, RICO conspiracy prosecutions, Racketeer Influence and Corrupt Organization Act, which is a mob-based set of laws that talks about people working together in concert to do something against the law. She's prosecuted more people in Georgia under their RICO statute, which is even broader than the federal one, than like all of – like five of her um, DAs that – were her predecessors combined. So, and she's got a RICO expert that she hired a couple of years ago that just sits with her to talk to, to prosecute these kind of cases. So I think she's got the RICO, she's got the Rudy Giuliani and his influence over 
you know, uh, the fake elector pushing that he was doing, the meeting with legislators all over Georgia. He's got, she's got uh, Lindsey Graham and the phone call about, you know, can't we just throw out all the absentee ballots, the mail-in ballots? Like, no. <laughs> we, and why are you calling me? You're calling you from South Carolina. Why are you calling me? Um, so she's got all that. We'll see. If one of them indicts, let me just run through it. He'll move to dismiss the indictment. It will lose. If it's federal court, the, 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 the trial is going to be not in Florida. I think the trial is going to be in D.C. And if the trial is in D.C. with a, a Democratic-leaning jury, okay, after the grand jury, um, sure, he'll, he could take the fifth, which he'll lose. He could not testify. They could bring a parade of people. But they're going to – if they have brought that case, it's because they have cooperating witnesses that have already pled guilty to some, some, something, and they're ready to go. If people think when Jack Smith makes a recommendation on criminal prosecution that it's going to be based on them just flashing up a bunch of tweets from Donald Trump and hoping the jury convicts, that is not going to be the case. It's going to be after a Mark Meadows – by the way, where is Mark Meadows these days? they got to put out a search party for him. He may be cooperating. Okay. Didn't he? Didn't he? I read that he went in a couple of days ago. He wasn't he, he did. He went into the to the grand jury, but right. that that is not. A, sometimes that's a sign of kicking and screaming, getting dragged into a grand jury, and some of that is we've worked out a deal, and he's testifying before the grand jury to avoid his own prosecution, cooperating witness. So they're going to start lining up a number of these people who they have in the crosshairs, who they need to squeeze, and 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 talk about taking away their own life and liberty or their own liberty, sorry, and put them in criminal jeopardy to get them to testify. Because if there are not live witnesses that matter, that testify against Donald Trump, I agree with you. He does not get convicted at a trial like that. They're not going to be able to do it through social media, his tweets, and some other circumstantial evidence that they're going to try to connect the dots on in front of a jury. Jury's got to hear from live people like Mark Meadows, like some of the Jan 6 people who testified like you know the uh, the uh, people that work with the chief of staff, the Secret Service people, they got it, and that's what they're doing. People are like, indict, indict, indict. Where are the witnesses? They need witnesses to cooperate with them, and you know they're busy stripping away executive privilege and attorney-client privilege from the grand jury, and that's all great to get the indictment, okay? But when you're in court in a real trial. Witnesses without hearsay have to testify against Donald Trump, and that's what I believe is the hard work the Department of but Justice. But people are scared is doing. of him, aren't they? I mean, yeah. this is the reason why people have not flipped on him before. You know, there's been little things, you know, like the doorman at Trump Tower, or you know, a few people occasionally who've kind of come forward and found the confidence because they're genuinely worried that they might get killed, and 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 so you kind of have to take that fear out of the equation to enable people to speak freely and know that there won't be repercussions. And if he's running for president, then they're going to think, well, you know, in a, in a good way, he can pardon me. And we've seen that plenty of times. But in a bad way, he can also have me, you know, ostracized. And, and remember, look, if we were living in an ordinary world, like normal, after trying to extort Vladimir Zelensky on the phone, right, over the Hunter Biden stuff and, and the Joe Biden stuff. He would have been impeached. He would have been, which would have been ratified in the Senate. He would have not be the president anymore. Somebody else would have taken over. And this whole trajectory of madness would never ensue. But it's not normal. This guy was impeached twice and got away with it. There was the Russia investigation, which we all thought we were like, this is it. This is the moment when, when Trump is going down. The, the Robert Mueller investigation. And again, they just managed to twist it and he wriggled out of it and he held up a newspaper that said that he'd been exonerated. Ex exonerated. And it was like the whole, he's such a P.T. Barnum that he manages to turn all of these events that would crush anybody else, that would put everybody else and anyone else behind bars. I mean, Watergate is not even a, it's not even a moment in time in Trump's history of criminal activity. You know, by, by today's standards, we are so immune to this behavior that Watergate, you know, you, you had to be around in the, in the 70s and understand what, what society was like and what the mood was like and what politics was like to know why that was a scandal at that moment in time. Yeah. But by today's standards, Trump has trampled all over that. He 
He's the new Teflon Don, as you as you said earlier. Um, also, because he knows no shame. You talked earlier about uh, some scientists have found his conscience somewhere. I didn't realize that they were searching for it. Um, I don't believe he has one, but um, he, he knows no shame. Richard Nixon, all you had to do was impeach him or threaten to impeach him. And he typed out a resignation, got on a helicopter like the fall of Saigon and left the White House. Yeah. Okay. Trump would never do that. Trump got impeached twice, and he was like, mm, let's go. <laughs> Keep because going. he hates to lose. The he idea hates- of losing anything. And that's why he said before the election that if I lose, then it's a fraudulent election. The yeah, same language years before. That, that Jair yeah. Bolsonaro copied. And then we saw a storming of, of, of the parliament in, in Brazil. The, the, um, Roger Stone invented the stolen election thematic yeah. Three years before the election. So I don't know how you steal something that hasn't happened yet. Um, but, you know, to, to, for people to think, as you said, that, that we're changed or we're chased by this era of Trump. I just read today that the Michigan GOP is about to install all election deniers <clears throat> into their leadership. Yeah. And people still think, despite Trump's own um uh, hiring of a consultancy firm, Berkeley Research, and he's spending a million dollars to go find fraud and then reporting back to him and Mark Meadows in the White House that they ran down all of the crazy theories of dead people voting, of multiple voting, of out of precinct voting, of anomalies of voting, and none of it panned out, not to the extent that would overcome the tremendous electoral advantage in, in voting that, that Joe Biden had. And it doesn't matter. I got news for everyone, not our group, but in general. There is fraud in every election. It's just so infinitesimal. It's so small that it doesn't matter. It's not the first dead person to ever vote. It's not the first yeah. husband that brought the dead wife's ballot to vote for whoever she wanted, whoever he wanted. It happens all the time. But it's and, like and point. It, it could be felons, like in and, Florida. And felons voting. Who it were happened. given a voting, a polling card and right. said, you can vote. And you then they vote. voted and then they got arrested. Then, right. I mean, it's but people don't talk about the fact that there was never enough fraud to change the outcome that's of the, the election. point it's not no fraud it's that there's never enough fraud when it's 0.01 or 0.007 percent of the voting population that doesn't overcome seven million votes spread out among the battleground states i mean i just don't get why people don't understand they don't want to understand basic math um and and we we need to flip the script we're not talking about zero fraud there's never been in the history of America zero. You know, the old joke was vote early and vote often. The, yeah. You know, we go back to to Joe Kennedy financing John F. Kennedy's election and the joke that's well known that Joe Kennedy, you, you know, the joke that Joe Kennedy said about financing the election? Tell, tell us. He said, I'm financing a win, not a landslide. <laughs> in other words, I'm yeah. buying votes, but he, let, let's buy what we need and not more than, not more than yeah. we need. So this has been going on forever. It just didn't. It didn't affect the outcome of the election. It's not the reason Donald loud, Trump lost. You know, this idea of saying that you know the election is rigged that in itself devalues democracy so much. It has a lasting effect. It means that people like Carrie Lake in Arizona can use the same script, <laughs> and people think it's true because they've heard it before, and because it's become part of the modern vernacular. And, you know, Carrie Lake probably knows full well that she lost. I bumped in. I, I bumped into, uh, uh, I was having lunch at, the, at a bar in New York um, recently. And I had a 30-year-old uh, uh, guy who's a traveling salesman for a, a farming company next to me, but lives in New York. He's from the South. He's born in the South. Republican, country club Republican, golfer. And he, uh, we talked, within a minute, he figured out that our politics weren't aligned. And I told him about the podcast. And he launched right into, it was almost like he pulled out a palm card. He launched into all his talking points about the fake electors, the fake election. And do you really think Joe Biden beat Trump by 7 million? I'm like, you don't? I mean, why don't you? Like, what have you heard or read statistically, you know, analytically? Um, and back to trust in government. Why, When the head of cybersecurity for the elections says this was the most, this was the most fraud-free election fraud free election that we've ever had the most secure election since we left paper ballots when i first cast my first vote when i was 18 i went into a giant 1950s style voting booth 
big metal contraption with a curtain. And I pulled a red lever and the curtain shut behind me. And then I like I flipped these analog dials. And then somewhere on a punch tape card thing, it went. And then at the end of the day, the very nice lady at the firehouse loaded these boxes of ballots and cards, who knows where, and off it went. But I trusted the election process. That was okay for me. Now with optical readers and electronic voting and ATM style vote, fraud doesn't happen. A couple of dead people vote. A couple of people vote in the wrong precinct and a couple of felons get misled about their voting rights. But other than that, it doesn't mm. overcome the vast majority of people that voted. Have confidence. We don't need purple fingers, you know, and like hold them but up that, to the rest that of the world. That says that it's the safest vote and the safest election. You're reading it and I'm reading it, but the people that need to read it are not seeing it. It's True. not being reported on Fox. It's not appearing in their Facebook feed, wherever they're getting their news from. It, it is it is missing from the, from the from the agenda, and so this is why the guy in the bar has a completely different experience of voting in America to you, and he is a hundred percent convinced that he is right. Oh yeah. And having <laughs> some guy in funny glasses show up and tell him otherwise is or definitely two guys. not going right, to Right, right. I wasn't worried of those. But, that, <laughs> <laughs> but, but look, you're exactly right. One of the things that's come out of the um, summary judgment that Dominion Voting Systems filed in Delaware for the $1.6 billion defamation case against Fox and all of its on-air personalities, including what they apparently internally refer to as the big three, which is Tucker Carlson, Hannity, and Ingraham. In the emails buried in there, of all the ones that were in there, and there were so many, the one that I love the best that just shows that they are um, just in completely out for the buck, which we always knew, is when, when one of the on-air reporters went and fact-checked Donald Trump about Dominion voting systems, the, the plaintiff in the case, and said in her tweet and her, her social media, there is no evidence of voter fraud committed by Dominion voting systems in the way those their machines operated during the election. <laughs> Did you catch this one? Yeah. Tucker Carlson texted the other two, uh, Hannity and Ingraham, and said, make her stop. Somebody fire her right now. She's killing the ratings. All yeah. they were worried about is that if there wasn't this fraudulent election theory for them to grift off of, that all the eyeballs were leaving um, Fox News and going to CNBC or, or CNN because Joe Biden winning was infinitely boring from a rating standpoint and they were losing interest in anything else. So what did they gin up? They ginned up fraud in the election. And, and while we're at it, why don't we club to death on national television a company like Dominion Voting Systems or Smartmatic or one of the other ones? Because who cares? Our ratings are what matter, not their revenue even though we're supposed to be pro-business Republicans, which I don't understand. But I love the, you know, on air, it's Dominion Voting Systems. Get to the bottom of the fraud. We have fraud in the election. And the behind the scenes is stop her from talking. Take her out in the back and shoot her. She's killing mm. the ratings. But this, this flies in the face of the patriotism that I keep going back to with the culture. The, that, you know, to love America and to save America and to be proud of America and, and to, be a, to be a patriot is is not to devalue the election and then the safety of the election. And, and, and so that's what, for me, is like a, a contradiction with these people, that they are, it's all about money. Because as long as Hannity and Carlson are number one in the ratings, they can renegotiate their contract with Fox, they can get another few million dollars a month, they can set their lives up the way that they want them, effectively, you know, in their ivory towers, protected from any of the viewers that, you know, I'm sure that these people have never even met the viewers that they that they are indoctrinating. But that's the tragedy of this, is that you know, American culture means that there is an increasing evidence that everybody has their price, that the dollar is king, whether it be the former president, whether it be F Fox News hosts, that money is more important than the country as a whole and and protecting the safety the integrity and the and the future of the country and 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 that is very sad i i don't really see that happening in other countries in the same way i think the fda should step in and they should force a warning label on the bottom of all the fox news like it's a drug and it should yeah. say warning 
This person doesn't believe a word that he's saying, and he's just doing it for the grift of ratings. And they just have that running at the bottom, like all that other, those other things that run at the bottom of Fox News, because that is what's come out of the Dominion voting systems. If you want to lose trust and faith and confidence in something, it should be in, if you ever thought that Fox News and its on-air newsotainment or whatever the heck that thing is at night, because it's not the news, um, was your, your um, main way to plug a feed in and get accurate information, it's all a lie. It's all a sham. I mean, it would be like Wolf Blitzer. I mean, if you found... You know, they, CNN gets a lot of grief. But if you found emails in which Wolf Blitzer took a completely op- opposite position from the news he was reporting or Lester Holt or somebody on Meet the Press or something, yeah. you know, people would be like shocked. But here, if it, it, nobody cares. Like you said, people put the blinders on that they have fashioned for themselves and they're never going to acknowledge new facts or real facts that are not that don't fit their theory. I mean, what is their job at the end of the day? You know, this is the thing. They're not journalists. They're, no. they're, sure. they're hosts. I mean, they're entertainers. They're, they're comics. I just, you know, that, that's what frustrates me. And I think anybody who has like a journalistic background and, you know, and journalism and integrity are intrinsically linked. And so for us to watch these people do their thing, because they're very skilled the way they operate and the way that they, they, they do this. And, you know, I, I interviewed this amazing woman who's decoding Fox News just a few weeks ago, and she has to watch it so that we don't have to. <laughs> and, and, I mean, she really does explain in, in such detail about how clever these people are at, at doing this stuff. They, it's almost like brainwashing, and it's happening live on television. And this is the thing about this country. It's like it's not, it's, it's a very nonlinear country. You know, it's, it, it, it operates on so many levels. And I'm really learning. I love living here, you know, but I, I'm getting the opportunity to talk to people like yourself and to learn about this kind of multiple cultures where, you know, one, one lifestyle and one, and one existence can have no bearing on the other. And yet all we hear from our elected representatives are saving the middle classes. I mean, I don't even know who that, those people are. Uh, the, the, let's take America back thing. Back from what? The, the, yeah. We are, we are America. This is America, and you know the, this the amount of tremendous energy and psychic damage that we do to each other over politics and suffused with religion and taking away people's rights and acting like it's pie. If you get more rights, it takes yeah. rights away from me. Like it's a zero sum game of rights, which it isn't. And you've got media and social media based on ratings that um, continue to promote that division because it makes them money. The more people are rioting literally in the streets, the higher the ratings. I mean, you're a journalist. The old journalism line from nightly news, local news was, if it bleeds, it leads. Yeah. If the, Right? If, if there's blood on the street, that's the first story of, of the night. And you know, that's a sad commentary, but, you know, 90% or more, I'm sure, of, of Republicans get their main, their main news feed is from, is from Fox, and there is no news there. I gave an example on our own podcast. I said it would be the equivalent, I said, I was trying to, um, or maybe I did it in one of my hot takes, about the difference between the First Amendment protection of a real news organization and why you have to prove what's called actual malice in order for you to win a uh, on a defamation case against them and what actual malice is or is not and why that doesn't really apply to Fox News at all. I said, if, if like, a, like fill in the blank for your nightly news, if Lester Holt on, the, on NBC Nightly News said, and today at a rally, uh, Rudy Giuliani and Sidney Powell accused uh, Dominion Voting Systems and others of a tremendous uh, voter fraud that they say impacted the election and it should have been for Trump instead of Biden. Okay. If he then went on to say, and I agree with that, I think that there is massive fraud in this country, and I'm going to use my podium now as Lester Holt. Yeah. And, and I'm you should s- be appalled. And you should be appalled, and there, you should, and we're going to get to the bottom of this. That he's now crossed the line into actual malice and infotainment, and he shouldn't get the First Amendment protection that other news organizations enjoy, who sometimes also cross the line. I'm not going to say they don't also cross the line sometimes, 
There have been cases where legitimate news organizations like the New York Times and others have crossed the line, have committed defamation against somebody because either they knew or should have known that what they were saying was untrue or they were, they recklessly disregarded getting to the bottom of the truth or falsity of their reporting. But And that's what we're seeing now with Fox News because they would say one thing as a platform and an, and, a, and an amplifier, a trampoline for all of these crazy crackpot theories. And then behind the scenes, they were literally saying, Giuliani, nuthouse. Sidney Powell, she belongs in a loony bin. Um, mm-hmm. Rupert Murdoch, you know, I'm watching Rudy Giuliani, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. Get him off the air. We can't, we can't lead with this any longer. You can't have it both ways, Fox News. You can run an infotainment thing that you're running, but then you're going to get sued when you decide that you're going to sacrifice a company literally and put them and try to put them and all their employees out of business because you want to, you know, win the rating war that evening. We are doing them a service by calling them Fox News, (laughs) right? Every time somebody legitimate says Fox News, that is, that is really kind of a gift to, to the extremists. And that's the tragedy of, of, of it yeah. being part of the vernacular. Um, we have to finish because uh, <laughs> it's time. And we, we had a whole bunch more stuff to talk about, but you know, we'll have to do it on another, another day. I'm, I'm so thrilled that you've been uh, part of this Patreon launch episode. And um, I think people will be more keen to pay for you than pay for me. <laughs> I doubt, I doubt <laughs> so, that. <laughs> so uh, I'll have to invite you on for some uh, kind of extra content, bonus content. Sure. And sometime. bring me back. We'll talk about some of those other topics another day. I'd like that. Okay. Right. My, my, my great thanks to you, as always, and good luck with the Legal AF podcast, which continues to be a huge success. Michael Popok, thank you for being on thanks, the Anthony. Weekend Show. I'm Anthony Davis. Please subscribe to The Weekend Show on YouTube or as an audio podcast. And don't forget to visit patreon.com slash five minute news for exclusive Patreon only videos, bonus content, live Q&As for members, and all that extra stuff. So please subscribe for some exclusive access. Join me next week with a brand new special guest and three more factual news stories to discuss on the 5-Minute News Weekend Show with Midas Touch.